and weights learning organic chemistry together. So this is, of course, the A course in a three-quarter series, meaning you're going to be learning the entire subject matter of introduction to organic chemistry in those three quarters. We're going to lay the groundwork in this quarter, and I think I'll come to this a little later on in today's talk, but I think we're really going to touch on all of the major concepts for organic chemistry, and there are three of them. I'll come back to that later. I want to take a moment to, to go over the syllabus and uh, sort of talk about, talk about some of the basics here. So my contact information's up there. Best way to get in touch with me, I'm not really good with email, and best way to get in touch with me is catch me after class or come to my office hours. And I know sometimes people have a 10 o'clock class, sometimes people have an 11 o'clock class, and so I've set my office hours to bridge the 10 to 11, 10 and 11 periods. Honestly, you can stick your head in at other times. I'm pretty much around. If you, if you don't want to run across campus, you probably can call and say, oh, I'm out in social sciences. Can I run up to your office and catch you? That's probably going to work. Friday afternoons get very hectic because that's when I'm meeting with our TAs and planning the quizzes and so forth. So that's generally a bad time to meet with me. I've picked as our teaching assistants two of the department's very best graduate students. Johnny Pham and Buck Taylor. Are they uh, back in the, the back? There's Buck. There's Johnny. I want you to stand up for a moment. Johnny, Buck. So Johnny and Buck are going to be having office hours as well to help you out on Thursday and Wednesday, respectively. There's this great space outside my office with about six couches on it, three really big blackboards, and so we're going to do all of our office hours out there. I don't know if there'll be any sort of review sessions. We tend not to do a lot. Johnny or Buck may choose to do those, but in general, that's just a great space and seats maybe, I've seen as many as 50 people there, but certainly, certainly for getting together, 30 is 30 is very comfortable. Those will be on Wednesday and, and Thursday. And email is the best way to get in touch with them outside of office hours. I think everyone by now knows the textbook is by Smith. I'm really, really sensitive to this issue of the price of textbooks. I've gotten a lot of emails about international editions, first editions. Honestly, there are not that many differences between the editions of the textbook. The first differs on a couple of chapters later on that might affect your B or C courses. Content-wise, they're pretty much the same. The only thing that might differ is the homework problems, and the homework's going to be really well integrated into the course. So if you do use a different edition than the second edition, that's fine, but you're going to make, have to make sure you get the homework problems for chapters one to eight from a friend or from the, the library. There's a study guide or solutions manual. I don't consider it an absolute requirement. Um, solutions manuals are really a two-edged sword. If you want to do well in this course, who doesn't want to do well in this course? Who want to do that? Okay, if you want to do well in the class, what you need to actually do is work the homework problems and actually actively work them. And the one way to short circuit the learning process, because you're setting up pathways in your brain, you're literally creating neural connections there as you work through the problems. The one way to short circuit the process is to look at the problem, say, oh, oh I think I get it. Oh, let me look at the answer key. Oh, yeah, yeah, I understood that. And that just short circuits the process. So this, the answer key is a two-edged sword. You have to have to resolve. Actually, write out the problem. Take scratch paper, write out the problem. And by the way, for my, for my office hours, if you want to come and see me for help, what I want to see from you when you come to me, bring your class notes and bring the problems you work. They don't have to be neat. Nothing has to be neat. But a lot of times, we can take your class notes and actually go over things that you don't understand there. And the homework problems as well, I can get some feedback on how you're doing. So I really want to see those. We're not collecting the homework. I wish, I wish, I wish we were 
were in a class of 40 students where Johnny and Buck were giving you individualized feedback on homework. But you need the self-control with the solutions manual not to look until you've actually committed to writing an answer, going back to the problems, uh, going back to the text, and really wrestling with these. And that's the key to a lot of the learning in this. So molecular models. Molecular models are going to be integral to one of the three big concepts in the course, stereochemistry and understanding the three-dimensional structures of molecules. First of all, they happen to be a lot of fun to play with. It's actually fun to make these things. I put up a video on how to use them. What I didn't put was a link to another video on the web that's just really cute with music and everything on the molecule. Maybe I'll play it later on. Not today, I think. But what's really cute on, on uh, it's actually of, of pedagogical value, but of, of the mo models. This video is didactic on putting them together. It's by a friend of mine, David Austin, who had been a faculty member at Yale University. And anyway, you can, you can watch it. There's the website. So as I think people have received in my email, I'm trying something new this year, setting up a Facebook group for the class. Already, we have almost half the folks in the class in this Facebook group. This is one of the problems with a class of this size is the fact it's really hard to get to know your neighbors and really hard to interact with them. And this is um, what I'm trying to do is bridge some of that for peer-to-peer -peer interaction. This is not going to be a way for me to answer your questions or to communicate with you. What I'd like to see on there is some peer interaction. I don't know what's going to happen. It's an experiment. Um, if I want to communicate, I'll probably be sending an email out. Sometimes people will ask me a question. It's a really good question. I might broadcast an answer to everyone. Sometimes, as I said, I'm not so good with email, so it may get lost in my overflowing stack of email, which is why coming in person is the best way to reach me. But anyway, I'm really eager to see what, what happens. It may also be a good way to find people to study with who have similar interests and to answer each other's questions and so forth. All right, lecture hours, you're here, so presumably you know them. Discussion section. All right, the discussion section is absolutely critical to this course. And what I've tried to do is really to set up feedback loops, where each week the discussion section, with the exception of the very last week of class, which is going to be hard, each week the discussion section is going to focus on the previous week's topic, the previous chapter, and we're going to go ahead and reinforce the concepts that are in there. You're going to have some problems to work that are going to help you out. Those problems and the homework problems are going to come back on the quizzes, which I'll tell you about in a moment. The discussion sections are, there are 12 of them. You have to be enrolled in one, but you don't have to get to that particular discussion section. If a different one works, that's fine. If you want to go to two, that's fine as well. The problems in the discussion sections, you will not find anywhere else. There will not be answer keys to those problems. They won't be posted on the web. And they will come back on the quizzes. So the discussion sections are a chance to really wrestle with the problems. And if everything works out, it's going to be you each of you who's getting up and going to the blackboard in the discussion section and helping your peers with the problems and helping really get a discussion going. Because the discussion sections relate to the previous week's material, we're not going to be having a discussion section this week. I presume people have sort of figured that out. Or next week, so they're going to start the following week. The one week that's going to be, well, as I said, Week, eight's, uh, week 10 is going to be tough because everything comes crashing in. Read the last week of class is really hard. I wish, I wish, I wish we had a reading week between final exam, between end of classes and final exam week, and we don't, which means our last class is going to be on chapter 8 on alpha 
hail hides our last set of classes, our last week of classes. Concurrently, the TAs are going to be working very hard to help teach you in that week material that you're learning at the same time. And then, alas, and I wish I could, could we could do it some other way, that's going to be coming right back to you on the final exam the following Wednesday. So that last week of classes is going to be really tough. The other week that's tough for a different reason, a logistic reason, is Thanksgiving week, because we only have discussion uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, so we're all going to have to get involved in those those discussions, the uh, the second discussion sections that will will occur in those days. All right, we already have reading assignments. We already have homework assignments. Really important to keep up. There are problems through the chapter. Work them as you read along. Scroll them out. Take some scrap paper. Take some notebook paper. Scroll those problems out as you go along. And then there are homework assignments at the end of the chapter. <coughs> attendance. Not taking attendance but it is really mandatory. There is so much and it happens so fast that if you're just trying to do things on, the, on your own, you're going to miss out. Um, let's see, discussion sections, the same thing. So, quizzes. We will have six quizzes in this class. They will occur on Mondays, first thing in the morning, 9 o'clock. You're late, you're in trouble. The quizzes, as I said, will be taken directly from the discussion section problems and the homework problems. There's no reason that you can't master that material and get perfect scores on all of the quizzes. I really want people to be mastering the material that we're covering here. The quizzes will be on a 10-point scale, roughly. A is, or 10-point scale, roughly. A is a, a 10. B grades are 8 and 9. C grades are 6 and 7, etc. I don't give B minuses in the class. A B minus is a failing grade. There are no makeup quizzes. If you miss a quiz, it counts as a zero. I dropped the lowest quiz grade. It is important to take all of the quizzes. I understand people may be sick. That's the reason I drop a quiz grade, because I know there are factors beyond your control. But if you're saying, oh, I'm not confident, I can miss one, I'm gonna, I, I don't want to do this, I'm going to miss this quiz, you're already setting yourself up for a pattern of failure in the class. Seating isn't assigned on the quizzes. It will be assigned on the midterm and finals. I think everyone has a row number on their seat or a letter on their seat on the quizzes. Let's see, I see A's here. Maybe, yeah, it's row A, and I think there's, what, a number, yeah, on your seat. On the quizzes, I'll be asking you to write your seat number next to a signature on an academic honesty statement. You'll need to record your seat number in order to receive credit. Quizzes and exams are going to be returned electronically through your drop boxes. You're not going to get a hard copy back. I will keep the hard copies. I also will have electronic copies of all of your quizzes and your, your exams. And there's an EEE Dropbox feature for getting them back. We have a midterm exam and a final exam in the class. The midterm exam is on the Monday of week six, which is November 2nd. It's going to count for 30% of your grade. It's going to cover chapters one to four. The final exam is going to be comprehensive, and that's on the Wednesday during finals week. Molecular models are permitted. I'll talk more about this later. We're not going to be using them on the first couple of quizzes. I, they will come up by the midterm exam and the final exam. I encourage you to actually pre-assemble molecular models and bring them in a big bag, like a bag from the bookstore. It's going to help speed you out. As I said, it's not going to come up on the first couple of, couple of quizzes. 
Seating is going to be assigned. You will have to check the website, sit in your assigned seat. We will be checking uh, seat numbers and IDs during the midterm exam, during the final exam. As I said, we're not doing that on the quizzes. However, your handwriting will be compared to your midterm and final exam handwriting in order to ensure that, it is, that your quiz has been taken by you. All right, academic honesty. Academic honesty is strictly enforced in this course. Any sort of copying, collusion, allowing a fellow student to copy off of your paper will result in a failing grade in the course. I am the ultimate arbiter on academic honesty matters, so if there is a case of academic honesty, dishonesty, you will fail plain and simple. Please read the academic honesty statement and contact me if you have any questions about it. I will be asking, I wish that we had a formal, um, what do they call it at universities, a formal um, honesty pledge in the course, there will, uh, in the university, there will be an academic honesty statement on each exam. You will be expected to read it, sign it if you are able to sign it. That will be the first thing on, certainly on the quizzes, and I believe the first thing on the exams. Cell phones, and I just heard a ding. <laughs> Cell phones must be turned off in the class. If your cell phone goes off in the class, if you take a phone call in the class, I will ask you to leave, not to come back for the day. The reason I do it is honestly, it is extremely disruptive to your classmates also to me, I will literally lose my train of focus down here with a ditter, ditter, ditter going on. You will be inconveniencing 435 of your classmates by having your cell phone go off. So turn it off. Enrollment. You don't allow us props to do anything around here. All they do is which is good, because we're absolutely incompetent on adding drop cards and everything else. And honestly, honestly, there are too many issues involved because you've got the labs linked to the lecture courses. I don't handle any issues of enrollment, any issues of add, any issues of drop. The undergraduate office handles that. We're not using drop cards, actually, this year. We're using WebReg. After the first two weeks, there's no adding or dropping the class. This is one of the reasons to do this is we are very, very tight. Honestly, I wish it were possible to go ahead and have some leeway because you're barely going to have a feeling for the material in that point. But realize that you are privileged to be here. I am very upset about the situation of funding at the University of California right now. As a result, we don't have enough lab sections, and because the labs and lectures are linked, it means that you are here and one other student, or maybe 30 students who want to get into this class are not. So unfortunately, it means that you're being here actually, you know, which is great, I'm happy to have you, but it means there's another student who's not here. So after week two, you really have to be in. All right, tutoring. There are lots of good options to get help in the class. First thing, catch me during your office hours, during my office hours. Catch the TAs during your office hours. However, there are also two other great programs. The one that's very near and dear to my heart is the chemistry department tutoring program. This is free. It's run by very talented, some of our best undergraduates. Matt Nguyen, where are you? <coughs> Matt is the chemistry department tutor. There is a link 
to the website. There will be hours and so forth for help. That room, I believe, is in Natural Sciences 2. It's on the second floor. And there is also tutoring available through LARP. All right, any, any questions? Sometimes there are some subtleties of maybe having some CH bonds or maybe things like carbon dioxide at least are excluded. But fundamentally, organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon compounds. And up until the beginning of the 19th century, people thought that there was an inexorable divide between organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, that only living things could make organic chemicals. And in 1828, Friedrich Kohler broke this paradigm and showed that he could make urea, not from kidneys, not from a human being or a dog, but in the laboratory from inorganic chemicals. And that was a major paradigm shift. And then the chemical industry later, off in the, later on in the 19th century took off with the dye stuff industry. It used to be that all of the dyes for clothing could only come from plant sources and animal sources like uh, shells and, and beetles. And then it was discovered that all of these beautiful chemicals could be made in the, or all of these beautiful pigments could be made in the laboratory. And now all of these wonderful purples and pinks and reds and so forth that we take for granted are relatively cheap synthetic chemicals. Health has always been an important part of organic chemistry, and in fact, the dye stuff industry came from a chemist's attempt, very crude attempt, a chemist named Perkin, to make a chemical compound that was used to treat malaria, quinine. Malaria was a big problem throughout the world, it still is in many parts of the developing world, not in the US right now, thank goodness. But quinine was the only treatment, and that came from the bark of a plant. And so Perkin tried to make quinine in the laboratory, and instead got a beautiful purple compound. And being clever, he realized sometimes when you do an experiment, and you don't get the result that you seek, you could actually do even better with the discovery that you found, and thus the dye stuff industry was born. 
Health has continued with antibiotics, with compounds to treat diseases like AIDS, and these are all products of the chemical industry. In fact, many of the PhD students who come through our program, like Johnny and Buck, will go on to careers in the pharmaceutical industry, helping to invent the next generation of medicines that fight disease. So I've mentioned some organic chemicals. I've mentioned urea. I've mentioned dyes. I've mentioned antibiotics. I've mentioned drugs to fight other diseases. What are some other organic chemicals? Alcohol, a great favorite. Later on, you will be learning about NMR spectroscopy. And the first NMR, not in our class, but in the B course, and the first NMR spectrum, nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum, the technique that now is very similar to the medical technique you've heard of as MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. The very first nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum was recorded on ethyl alcohol. <coughs> what are some others? Ethane. We will be learning about ethane and other alkanes, methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane, dodecane, undecane, etc. When we start talking about alkanes, which I think is going to be either yeah, in October, I believe, and maybe be into November, that will provide us into a platform on some of the big concepts I'm going to be talking about some other organic chemicals. Sugar. Sugar, fantastic. Not only is sugar sweet, but it is an important component of many living systems. On the surface of cells in your body, there are sugars that are attached. Different types of sugars make you, you, literally. So in your blood group, whether you're A or B or O, you're going to have different types of sugars attached to your cell surfaces. And in turn, your immune system is going to recognize whether you have sugars for the A blood group or the B group, group which is why if you're A, you can't get a, a transfusion from B, and if you're B, you can't get a transfusion from A. Sugars are also an important part of another biological molecule that is literally central to life, central to your genetic identity. What is that organic chemical compound? DNA. All right, sugars, Nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are two of the biggies for biomolecules. What's the third biggie? Proteins. So, everything from synthetic compounds like antibiotics, to alcohols, to useful things like natural gas and all of the things that derive from petroleum, which includes the plastic and many of the fabrics in your chairs, your nylon backpacks, and so forth are all coming from petroleum, to biomolecules like sugars and denucleic acids and peptides and proteins are all central to organic chemistry. And this is why, even if you aren't a chemist, it is so important to learn a little bit about organic chemistry.
Well, today I'm going to give you the three things that you need to know for the entire rest of the year. Then you can take all your final exams and graduate. Reactivity of organic chemists, chemicals 
is all about flow of electrons. And if you understand where the electrons are and what wants to get electrons, who has the electrons and who wants the electrons, that's, these are properties of functional groups, then you can figure out how different molecules react. And curved arrows are ways that we show the flow of electrons that in turn shows us where bonds form. Because when you share a pair of electrons, you form a covalent bond. When you take away a pair of electrons, you break a covalent bond. And so we are going to use a very simple notation, like so, to show electrons flowing from something that has electrons to something that wants electrons. <coughs> that should be familiar to you from general chemistry, and just write them out. We'll take hydrogen, and there's our Lewis structure of hydrogen, just two hydrogen atoms, H2, with a pair of electrons <laughs> shared between the two hydrogen atoms, constituting a covalent bond. Take another example, carbon dioxide. And here's our Lewis structure of the molecule, and here are our lone pairs of electrons. Carbon brings four outer shell electrons to the table. Oxygen each brings six. When we take our six plus six plus four electrons and distribute them in such a way that everybody gets a full octet, our electrons end up being distributed like this with a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen, a double bond between the carbon and the other oxygen, and two lone pairs of electrons on each oxygen atom.
I will contrast against our covalent bonds, I'll contrast ionic bonds. Ionic bonds involve electrostatic interactions between ions. So let's take two examples, compounds that you've probably seen in general chemistry or, or even more commonly. Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride as a salt crystal is held together by electrostatic interactions between sodium cations and chloride anions making up a lattice structure. It's a very strong set of interactions. The sodium chloride doesn't melt except at very, very high temperatures that are high enough to jiggle and pry the ions apart. Magnesium oxide is another example of a compound with ionic bonds. Magnesium oxide involves magnesium 2 plus cations and oxygen 2 minus anions again in a lattice. It's a very, very high melting compound, even higher than sodium chloride. Those doubly charged ions stick together very strongly. Most of organic chemistry involves covalent bonds. Almost all of the bonds that you encounter are going to be covalent. Just because one shares doesn't mean one shares and shares alike. And so there are many covalent bonds in which electrons are not shared equally between the two atoms. These are called polar covalent bonds. Polar covalent bonds are important because much of the reactivity in organic chemistry comes from atoms either having an excess of electrons that they are willing to share or not having enough electrons, still having an octet, but sharing in such a way that that octet isn't shared equally, where they say to their neighbor, like the oxygen and carbon dioxide, the carbon and carbon dioxide. Well, you're sharing with me, but I don't feel satisfied. I kind of have eight, but I really don't have it because you're hogging it. And this type of react, this type of unequal sharing gives rise to a lot of reactivity in organic chemistry. I'll take a simple molecule, one that you've seen in general chemistry for starters. Hydrogen fluoride. So hydrogen fluoride involves electrons shared between two atoms with very unequal desires for the electron. Fluorine is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen. Electronegativity is a measure of how much atoms want electrons. 
Fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0. the most electronegative element in the periodic table. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2. The net result is that even though the fluorine and the hydrogen are sharing the electrons in the covalent bond between the fluorine and the hydrogen, the electrons in the bond are spending more time near fluorine. This in turn leads to a partial negative charge on fluorine and a partial positive charge on hydrogen. And we can designate that H F with a delta positive and a delta negative. Delta means partial charge. So it means that we don't have a whole negative charge. We have a little bit more negative charge in one, a little bit more positive charge in the other. And this is the reason why when you dissolve an acid like hydrochloric <coughs> acid in water or hydrochloric acid, you get a proton, H plus, and fluorine H mi uh, F minus rather than say the reverse. I'm going to talk next time more about electronegativities, but I want to give you one little take-home message just to, to maybe get us started on thinking about this. So electronegativity is important. And it's a good measure of whether you're going to have a polar covalent bond or an ionic bond. I'll give you a general rule of thumb. Polar covalent bonds generally have electronegativity differences of less than about two. sort of vague, I'll say greater than about two, but again, maybe, maybe we can say 1.5. 
And the final point that I'm going to leave us on is that nonpolar bonds, so how much electronegativity do we have to say to say it's polar? If it's less than about half a, a unit of difference, we would probably say it's nonpolar. So a nonpolar bond. And I'll put that in quotes because, of course, there might be a little bit of polarity. A nonpolar covalent bond. We'll say less than, and again, I'm going to be a little bit vague on this, less than about 0.5. So carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2. That's a very small difference. We would describe that as a non-polar bond. All right, we will pick up next time.